Big Brum is a theatre and education company based in Birmingham, UK. In 2018, the centenary of the end of the First World War, we um, proposed to the William A. Cadbury Trust that we would publish all five plays in our cycle, The End of Reason, 1914 to 18. So today we are launching those materials and a supporting set of teachers' resources. In order to do that, we've brought together a group of some of the people involved in the project, including the play's author, Chris Cooper, and the current artistic director, Richard Holmes. Chris, as the then artistic art director, you were very struck by this quote from Hugh Strachan. And in a lot of ways that underpins the whole project. What was it about that quote that seemed so significant to you? Um, sorry. Uh, hi, thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, for us all to share this together. Um, well, I think the thing that the origins of the project uh, predated slightly uh, 1940 or 2014 when we first um, set it in motion. And I think that was a combination of watching gradually the disappearance of survivors, combatants, or people who actually lived the experience. And my own experience of seeing how the poppy was being used in society uh, in a way that I felt was increasingly um, shallow and at times bullying. Um, and at that point, as we were approaching the centenary, that's when uh, in the company, we discussed how we could create a cycle of plays where we could look at a change in the era from between centuries into modernity um, and the end of reason and how reason died in the trenches in the First World War and how that shaped the world that we live in today. So that connected then and now and um, that's why uh, we decided to think very much about well what what can we say about then that is resonant with now and why we live in the way that we do? And of course, it turned out over the period of four years to be extraordinarily resonant with the period of a hundred years earlier. So I suppose um, what struck me was a great fear that we would emerge without fresh perspectives that we would have a repetitive and sterile experience as Strachan was fearful of. And today's paper, uh, I opened an article uh, by Samuel Earl, who's a writer, and he wrote an article in The Guardian today saying that Remembrance Day is an exercise in collective amnesia. And it feels now as we're losing all the veterans from the Second World War, we're about to repeat the same um, mistakes. And it seems to me and it seemed to us in the company that we really needed to create an opportunity to not just map the experience of uh, the First World War, but connect it with the lives of the young people that we work with in Birmingham, many of whom whose heritage comes throughout what was then the whole of the empire um, through their grandparents, through their great grandparents and all of those lost voices that are hugely neglected still to this day. Um, who made a massive contribution to the war effort and made many, many sacrifices. So that was the idea of producing the cycle of plays under the umbrella of the end of reason and then focusing on a particular aspect each year, taking a play for each year of the war. And the second thread we wanted was to uh, build what we call talking to. Um, which was a recognition, again, as part of this collective amnesia, that every year we would ask people to wear a poppy and be silent for two minutes. And yet we felt the absence of actually talking about the experience of the war and its impact on our lives today. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to realize it in the way that we wanted to, because at that time we went through a crisis of financial resources. Um, however, I think what we were able to create was an experience where we gave young people a big opportunity to connect their lives today with the end of reason cycle. 
Thanks, Chris. And I think now is a good moment, perhaps, to remind people of, of what those five plays are and were. So this is the contents page from the, the plays, which we're launching today. And the plays are in order. Part one, 1914, Home Front, Front Line. 1915, Sepoys Salute. 1916, Over the Top. 17, The Land Between Two Rivers and 18 Worlds Apart Together. And I'd like to just share an image um, from the 2014 production of Home Front Frontline. This is Danny O'Grady as Percy, Percy Duggan, who's the central character there. And I wonder if you could say a little bit to us about that um, production and that play, Chris. Well, it, it felt very interesting. One of the ironies that struck me of the whole of the of that first period um, was that the world literally changed beyond recognition. We went from essentially a Victorian era into a completely industrialized, uh, not only industrialized warfare, but mechanized existence. And yet people's lives essentially hadn't changed a great deal. Um, most people hadn't left their town, their communities, let alone travel to foreign lands. And yet here we had through mass conscription, the mass movement of millions of people. I mean, within two weeks, 21 million people were mobilized um, from all corners of the earth, which is why it was the first world war. But for young people like Percy, who had spent their lives digging trenches in fields, uh, suddenly found themselves transported into a foreign land and a foreign culture. And what were they doing? They were digging trenches in fields as this advance became a retreat and the BEF ended up digging themselves into the ground and that horrific standoff that we recognize as that seminal image of the First World War began to unfold in the great barbaric tragedy. And I felt that what was interesting about Percy was his horizons actually had not extended at all. And yet his experience was not only exploiting him like so many people were and the kind of unquestioning sacrifice and cruelty um, that was expected from working class people uh, in the UK throughout the so-called colonies at the time and what the expectation of the suffering um, could be expressed very simply through this act of digging where literally he's digging himself to a standstill but metaphorically he becomes totally entrenched and that feeling of being suffocated and entrenched um, is something that we all recognize. I think every child knows what it feels like to be stuck, bogged down, stuck in the mud, unable to break out. And that was the kind of claustrophobic um, reality that the war that was supposed to end by Christmas gradually, in fact, very rapidly transformed itself into. And we wanted to explore how being entrenched is both a psychological and a physical reality. Thanks, Chris. And I've got some images here from the um, teacher's resource for, um, for Home Front Front Line. That I'm just going to share with you here. So this has been designed by Rob Bowden um, for us, and they explore questions about Percy's story, about being entrenched, about the land and how the use of the land changed. And it looks at a period of 100 years from um, 1914 through to the present day, and it includes maps, key questions, and of course that use of a spade of objects um, linked to Percy's story. So it just gives you a little bit of a flavour of some of what's going to be there in the in the teacher's resources linked to that. So the second play is Sepoy Salute. Um, and that's also, in a sense, about the land and being entrenched as well, I think. So um, I think you just faded away from me there, Ben, but uh, were you asking me about sepoy salute and being entrenched yeah okay i mean i think that i think that it is both in that sense quite similar 
but also different in the sense that I think the situation in Sepoy Salute is, is one whereby human isolation uh, that is a product of the kind of extreme experiences that so many of the combatants felt um, brings together three people from completely different um, cultures who are dissociated from themselves by their labor, by nature, <laughs> from geography, their history, culture, class and beliefs dissociates themselves from not only themselves but from each other and they are literally thrown together by the power of a gas attack um, and they have to deal with their relationship to the soil beneath their feet and the focus particularly uh, on Sepoy uh, which I'm sure Duran can speak about um, was very important to us because we uh, realized we were shocked to find that four million um, sepoys were mobilized in the Indian continent in support of that war and how many of them were literally thrown into something that was blinding both emotionally and ideologically and physically obviously in the case of gas attacks and how they had to find their own sense of uh, reason for justifying how they live in those conditions, their relationship to the land that they've left, and their relationship to this land that they found themselves in, and how they understand what it means to be human in a very real and extreme way. And that really um, is a clash that is set where a man of the earth, a man of the soil, the sea boy, meets a man of steel, a man who's spent his life in the uh, iron mills, the steel mills of the north, and a man who is a commander of an Indian force, but he's not Indian, or he's not, um, there wasn't an Indian in that sense, of course, but we like to refer to it as a member of the Raj, who was given command of people that he absolutely despised but most of all, he despised himself. And it's in that situation that the conflicts of empire, class, race, and faith really come to the fore in a very, very human situation where three people are lost and they have to rely on each other to survive. I mean, just just on that, Chris, because uh, Diren is here um, and Diren who played the sepoy that's in the picture at the moment. And he's joining us from New Zealand, where he, he lives at the moment. And I and you sort of mentioned that, you know, it'd be interesting to hear from Diren. So, Diren, I just wondered whether you could maybe just discuss what, in your experience, from being in the play and on the tour, was important about sharing the Sepoy story. Uh, yes, thanks, Rich. Um, I think the the first thing to say is my own naivety of or my own lack of understanding around what um indians from that time went through was important um for myself personally that's a bit cathartic but that is honestly something that i came across when i realized and i think the first thing that i noticed was how heavy the suit was when i put it on and i realized um you know this is quite tough a tough piece of uniform to put on and perform a play in. Imagine being gassed in it and having to run through a forest. And there are various scenes within the play where um, the sepoy picks up the commander and it all felt very difficult and very uncomfortable. And just trying to imagine what it would feel like off the back of a gas attack was it was a whole nother level. I think if you go, uh, when I dug a little bit deeper and I thought about some of the things like um, how um, loyal the sepoy was, but also how much he um, he suffered from the like the class divisions that were in the army as well. Um, like being asked to salute straight after a gas attack when he meets the commander for the first time. Um, kind of he by the end of the play, he sort of drums up the the courage to describe uh, one of the characters as a deserter. 
but it takes a lot for him to do that. And he still doesn't feel like he could leave the commander behind, even though another gas attack is coming. And it just kind of occurred to me that um, there was a lot more than just turning up and joining the army for these men. It was very much a kind of, um, how do they make sense of everything? You know, him digging the soil or bringing soil with him and then burying it in a foreign land was the only way he could make sense and feel safe, I guess, in some ways in the middle of a conflict. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, occurred to me um, overall. And then I think also just working with the children in the areas, um, a, lo a lot of kind of Asian communities, um, a lot of Muslim communities and the Sepoy was Muslim. So um, I think for them, there was a, a, a kind of a genuine surprise when they saw some of, it might've been the first time that they ever understood that there was a Muslim soldier who fought for the British army in World War I. And seeing that reaction from them was um, quite interesting. It sparked some really interesting questions and discussions. And I think I learned more than I probably could have taught, to be honest. But um, those are some of my main reflections, I'd say. Thank you very much, Darren. That, that That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, if I can, um, I'd like to bring us on to play three, Over the Top. And to quote you, Chris, it's a play about ordinary people undertaking extraordinary journeys. Um, and we'd like to just share a moment from the film of Over the Top, which is on our YouTube channel. So Siobhan, you played Kitty in Over the Top, and that's you that we could just see. Um, she's an Irish nurse serving the British in the trenches while her own country is fighting for its independence. Now, I just wondered, what was your experience of sharing that story? Um, well, actually, watching that clip back kind of brought back a lot of like the, uh, the sort of Did you get any of that? No, no, but it was on the <laughs> Sorry, I was just saying that that clip actually brought a lot of the experience back of portraying Kitty. Um, I think addressing 1916 in such a way uh, was really important. Um, I mean, 1916 was such a turning point for Irish history. Um, and, you know, there was hundreds and thousands of Irish men and women fighting on the front line, um, whilst hundreds of Irish men and women were fighting on their own doorsteps. Um, and the conflict of people going to the front line to fight for British, whilst people fighting on their doorsteps are fighting against British rule, um, that must have caused such conflict, not only in Ireland itself amongst the people, but within themselves. Um, and I think that was really important to share with the young people and, and get them to engage in que questions of their own conflicts of what are they living for and what are they fighting for and what are they surviving for? Um, and it really did bring up some really interesting discussions. And I think those sort of conflicts can take us through right till today. I mean, look at 2020, what are we, what are we fighting for? What are we living for? And what are we surviving for in a year like this? Um, and to think back to over the top when that was portrayed through a nurse, I mean, it's it's still relevant today when we think about how people fight on the front line in different ways. Um, and I just really think it, it brings us back to that meaning of what it is to be at home in this world and I think that's really important for young people to explore. Thank you so that's another of those kind of connections to, to young people's own lives I guess. Now the fourth play The Land Between Two Rivers is a little bit different 
from the others. For a start, it's not been performed, or at least not yet. Um, Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yes, I mean we weren't able to uh, we weren't able to uh, do the production as as planned at the time, and 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 we explained that in the in the book. Um, but it was an interesting uh, choice at the time. I think all the things that Dieran has said and that Siobhan's just said about how uh, identity is mediated between our action in the world, whether it's digging or whether it's scrubbing and it's laboring to create and make an impression in the world, is interface with ideology, that sense of who we are, how our identity, how we can make a home in the world is present in all of the plays. And in 1917, we had many choices, very important choices of where we could choose to look, not least, for example, um, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, which um, is woefully misrepresented in, in popular retellings, the narratives um, about both, both wars, actually. Um, but eventually, uh, I settled on Mesopotamia, the Mesopotamian uh, campaign, which, of course, uh, Meso being from the Greek word meaning between, uh, and Potamia from, from water, meaning the land between two rivers, which became what we now know as Iran, uh, Iraq, and then to the north, Turkey, and then to the east, Syria. Um, and that area, which at that time was being safeguarded mainly through British strategy to protect the bridgehead to the empire in India. Um, however, of course, already, they were beginning to understand its significance in terms of oil. And at the time of thinking about writing the play was at the time that um, the final conflicts with ISIS were underway. Um, and that interested me deeply. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pursue that any further. And looking at the significance of Basra and Mosul uh, and those, those towns. Um, and it was in 2020 that I was able to return to it because of this project and the relevance of it um, was resonating just as strongly because of course not only were we coming through the real Brexit crisis which we were experiencing as we were working on with the top but also the Black Lives Matter protest and our place in terms of the British I say our the British state's place uh, historically in those questions and that was still resonating extremely strongly as it was when we worked on Worlds Apart together so it seemed the natural place to stay because the future that was being shaped by the British mandate um, in the 1920s uh, which extended to Palestine and the sags pico uh, agreement has shaped that region um, and continues to shape it today in the most extraordinary way. And it felt like if we were ever able to perform it, and hopefully one day that will be possible, um, there are so many unbelievably resonant connections with the young people of Birmingham, just in the way that Dieran talked about how he, his presence in the Sepoy Salute inspired young Asian women to write to the company about their own history. And I'm sure that that is what Siobhan is describing in her own experience. I think that there now is shockingly clear about what the British strategy and role was in what was then Mesopotamia and of course has since been in uh, the latter day invasions of Iraq and in the so-called war on terror and the fight against ISIS and all of those struggles which continue to shape the narratives very much about what being a patriot is, about what being British is. Thank you very much Chris. Um, as you were speaking, it struck me that Kitty, as a nurse, is on the front line. And of course, that's another of those connections, perhaps, to the present day, because we're talking about um, NHS workers being on the front line of the, the COVID struggle today. And I think that that's um, those resonances in all of these stories. They're part of our living experience now, even though it's 100 years on from the events 
being described. Um, the last play in the cycle is Worlds Apart Together, which is actually set just after the end of the war. Out of all of them, it's the play that feels most to me like it, it's about the present day as well. It feels really immediate still. David, you were um, Harold in that play. And I was wondering what the play says to you. Yeah, Ben, um, so um, I, yeah, I played Harold and I think what's prevalent in Worlds Apart Together, that's prevalent today, is the story of displacement. So Harold was a soldier who had fought in the First World War. He classified himself as a British citizen. But when he left World War I and ended up in England, the majority of the population didn't see him as a British citizen. They saw him as a second class citizen, as dirt on the end of their boot. And I think that ties into what is happening today with refugees who are trying to leave war-torn countries, trying to escape famine, trying to seek refuge, not only in our country, but other countries across Europe and in uh, North America. And there's still that feeling, that sentiment amongst people that are wondering and questioning, well, why are they coming here? Well, they're coming here or they're coming to other countries to escape the horrors that's going on in their native lands and also to try and um, make a better life of this for themselves and for their children. Now, Harold, he wanted to go back to the West Indies. That's what he wanted to do. He, he wanted to make as much money as possible so he could go back to the West Indies. And, and that's all he, he, he wanted to do. But um, it seemed like that he was attacked for that. And the main issue was that, or the main reason why he was attacked for that was because of the color of his skin. And it also kind of ties into the Black Lives Matter movement. So that's currently still, that's very prevalent at the moment. Um, with Harold, a, a black man, he was seen as alien to the population of Great Britain at the time. His life didn't matter. And you've got all these incidences across, not only in North America, but ac even across Europe. And it's not really highlighted of police brutality against young black people, men and women. And how much does their life matter? And I think there's a paradox between the two. And it just shows that in a hundred years time, over sorry, over the span of a hundred years, there's still this issue that we're dealing with, so that society are dealing with. Yeah, so that sense of immediacy, it's very present, isn't it? In the, in the pulling mm. down of monuments, the experiences that people are having, the death of George Floyd, all of those, of those things that are happening right now. And of course, the COVID crisis is also alive in the play, is part of the background to it. Um, well, the, 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 the Spanish flu epidemic is part of it, and that's something that's picked up. Again, in the resources by Ed Lee and Chris Bolton, in the activities that they used, built around um, Worlds Apart Together and Over the Top. I guess you know, the, the, the word, the term that Big Brum uses when it's talking about those things is, is the angle of connection, finding those connections between our lived experience today and the, the experiences in the story, in the drama. Chris, do you, do you want to add anything about that? about kind of what, what we mean by angle of connection, I guess, in this context. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, I think David Olasoga um, made a comment in one of his pieces um, about the throwing of the statue into the channel in Bristol. And he was saying that rather than view, view life, um, our life, our history being trashed, he was saying, no, history is actually being made. And what he's talking about is that we live in the present. We're not abstract narratives that are retrospectively constructed. We are part of our living present. So 
whenever we try and make any drama, any theater, any plays, anything, whatever it is, whether it's Shakespeare, the Greeks, or, or something like the First World War, which can seem very distant at one level from a child's experience, those core questions about what it is to be human still resonate with any child today. And David's just given a very eloquent um, connection there between the life of Harold in 1918 in the midst of a demob happy country, which is bitterly, bitterly uh, undernourished, impoverished, cold, beset by Spanish flu, um, and the parallels with how migrant people, people who have been brought as say the Windrush generation was not so long ago, and still similarly, be treated as foreigners, as outsiders, where the other is animated as something to fear rather than something to embrace. And I think that any child understands that, whether it's in a playground, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's on our streets, the fear of the other that can paralyze us and set ourselves against each other rather than recognize the commonality between us. So in all of the plays, with all of the situations that the uh, characters find themselves in the stories, which are very extreme and can seem very removed, actually we find a very concrete angle of connection through very human activities like digging, like washing, like cleaning, like caring, like nurturing, meeting people's desires, but yet every child, for example, knows how it feels to cue, to wait, to march, to be still, to be stuck, not to have agency. It's those very small connections through human actions in stories that really connect the present with the past. And it makes the present become more visibly, viscerally alive for young people. And that's, I'm sure, what the young people saw in Harold. They saw themselves, not someone from the past. They saw themselves now. And particularly if there were young people or children who were black or of, of colour. So for us, we're always trying to find that connection because the end of reason cycle is about today. It's not about then. And it's about the kids' lives today. I don't know if that... Yeah. No, it's, it's what Nikki Thorpe described as being about drawing on their own experiences to yeah. explore the themes of the stories. Yeah. I mean, Matt, there's a particular story that, that perhaps you might want to bring in at this 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 point, or a particular anecdote. Yeah, it's um, certainly never easy or necessarily comfortable. I spoke with a class of year six who had seen Worlds Apart together. They were all acutely aware of the prejudice that Harold had faced, suffered, um, the fact that he had fought for Britain during the war, but was discriminated against and beaten up when he tried to find work in England lots of comments around how unfair that was. Um, and one Asian pupil told us there are still people like that today and how he was with his mum in Asda and a man said that she was disgusting. So, you know, hearing that um, really brought everything crashing back to the present day. Yeah. And it, it's, um, it's something that David Andrews says in our introduction is that, um, you know, history is unsettling and it brings up these questions for us and I guess what we're trying to do with this work and what he, he describes is, is providing a space where we can be nudged aside from easy assumptions about the world we're in and beginning to learn beginning to explore those those perhaps very difficult um, uncomfortable things and injustices um, Rich. Well, I think, yes, thank you very much. Uh, that was, I found that very interesting actually. And, and it was nice going back to all those plays that we, that we all participated in. And, um, I, I think Chris mentioned earlier at the beginning, when we started talking that there were two parts to the work. So the theater was to, to stimulate and, as Ben's just said, unsettle people's relationship to the First World War in a way that evoked uh, those questions that we've been talking about. Um, questions about what does it mean to be at home in this world, which I think Siobhan was talking about. Actually, the, everybody's been talking about. 
Um, and the second part of the of the project was to give people space to talk um, in those two minutes that often are used to be silent. And um, coming up to 11 o'clock at on the 11th of of the month of the 11th um, uh, uh, of the 11th day, we'd like to give space for people to maybe start to do that um, because obviously it wasn't just about being silent, but it was about thinking and talking in that silence, even if it was just to ourselves. So we'd like to offer or create a space while those two minutes silent, that two minutes silence is happening for people to maybe begin to talk, even if it's just to themselves. Um, and we'd like to offer the questions. And I think in a way, Siobhan, you mentioned or started talking about these questions earlier and, and we'd like to share them because I think it gets to the heart of what everybody was talking to, yeah. talking about. Because we're going into a um, couple of minutes silence, I'd just like to take this moment to thank you all for joining us from wherever in the world you've come to and, and Dirin, you've come the furthest for this one. Um, so thank you for joining us for the launch. The um, resources and the plays will be available very soon on Big Brum's website. So please do go and have a look on that there. They'll be freely available um, and indeed available on demand as hard copies to Birmingham schools. So thank you very much indeed. And um, we'll just move on to those questions. <laughs>